So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are, and thank you for joining us today. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Patrick Gerard. So I will tell us a little bit, I will remind us about his accomplishments, and then we will go to the talk. So Patrick Gerard is currently a professor at Orsay Mathematics Department at the University of paris Clay and the former director of this department. He has been assistant professor at prestigious Ecole Normale Supérieure and a part-time professor at Ecole Polytechnique. His research interests lie in evolution PDE with a focus on high-frequency phenomena and on, on the long-time nonlinear dynamics. He received many awards, and I want to point out here the Servant Prize in 1998, the Leonid Frank Prize in 2014 from the French Academy of Sciences. Also, he was a speaker at ECM in 2004 in Stockholm, and also at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 2006 in Madrid. Also, I would like to point out that Patrick is famous as a great mentor. He has mentored 12 colleagues, according to uh, your C most recent CV that I could find, who got and who got PhD under his supervision. And he also has students that he's supervising in addition to right now. Many of them are creating super impactful mathematics as Patrick does himself. So speaking of that, um, let us go to Patrick, who will give us a survey of the Benjamin Honor equation with periodic boundary conditions okay thank you very much for your invitation thank you for your the introduction natasha it's a, it's a great pleasure to talk to everyone even if it's a little frustrating not to see you everyone but 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 that's the rule okay of this webinar and uh, and it's uh, i'm happy with that okay so um uh, as i uh, we agreed before before this talk uh, I would like that this talk is a little bit relaxing, so don't hesitate to interrupt me by using the chat, and uh, so you will you can send a, a, a question to the chat, and then uh, and then Natasha or, or the host uh, webinar host will interrupt me uh, in order to to ask the question. I, I I will be more than happy to answer the question as far as it's possible for me, of course. So I'm going to survey. Uh, an equation which is, I mean, which was uh, introduced more than 50 years ago by people from fluid mechanics and which uh, by in particular Brooke Benjamin and uh, and the physicist, the Japanese physicist Ono. Uh, and uh, this work uh, is in fact uh, um, based on many joint works, a series of joint works with uh, the late Thomas Kappeler, who sadly passed away in, uh, in May 30th, uh, of this year, and uh, with uh, his collaborator and my collaborator, Peter Topalov in Boston. Okay, so uh, maybe, uh, oh, 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 yes. So uh, the, the, the introductory slide is just to, to give you an idea of, of what is this Benjamin Ono equation. It's a model for, uh, it's a model for long internal gravity, gravity waves in a two layer fluid. So, so U is a function of, of the time and the position, which is one dimensional. And it, this function is real valued. It co corresponds uh, to uh, essentially uh, the, uh, the interface between, between typically the air and the water. And the assumption compared, for instance, to another equation that you probably uh, heard about, uh, which is the Kortevec de Vries equation, uh, here we are assuming that the the water has infinite depth, while in the case of KDV you you are looking at shallow waters. Okay, so it's it's very different, and in both cases it's a long wave uh, regime. Okay, so uh, so in that case you get this uh, this equation, and here you have a non-local non-local operator mod d. And uh, this non-local operator is very natural if you think of uh, solving the Laplace, uh, the Dirichlet problem in a half space. If you solve the Dirichlet problem in a half space, you will see that this operator arises as what is called the Dirichlet to Neumann operator. Okay, so it's a very natural operator here. And uh, I will assume throughout all the talk, the whole talk, that the function x 
the function u is two pi periodic in x. So I will work with periodic boundary conditions. This is not mandatory, of course. Uh, you could also work on, on the whole line, and there are, the, there are these two regimes throughout the literature. It turns out that what for what I'm going to talk about in this uh, application of integrable systems, um, this, this assumption is more appropriate. And I will come back to it maybe at the end of this talk. So this means that in Fourier representation, so I reminded you here the, uh, the formula for Fourier coefficient of a function on, on the circle of two pi periodic function. Uh, the, the, the operator mod D just corresponds to multiplication by the absolute value of the wave number. Okay, so that's just this. And the mean value, as if you take the mean value of both sides of this equation, you obtain immediately that the mean value in X of, uh, of the, the function U is a conserved quantity. And moreover, this mean value can be uh, easily adapted uh, because if you, if you have a solution U of this benjamin Nono equation, it's a very simple identity uh, and very simple exercise to check that uh, well, the function that I call u sub a, where a is a real number, the function u sub a is still a solution. So this function u sub a has an average a mean value, which is a plus the image value of u. And uh, uh, the only thing to be done is just this shift in the x variable, this transition by minus 2at. So this means that in some sense, you can always assume that your function u has mean value zero, if you like. Okay, so that's that's what is done here. Okay, so let's continue uh, with the, uh, a description, a short description of this equation. Uh, for those people who, who know a little bit about Hamiltonian systems, uh, I, I will introduce what is called the Poisson bracket, which is Gardner, called Gardner Poisson bracket. So if you have two functionals, f and g, of, of the, the function u, say, in L2 on T, uh, you can look at the, the uh, functional derivative of the gradient uh, of these two functionals, if they are well defined. They are also functions acting on u. And then you can compute this inner product with dx of a functional derivative of f against the functional derivative of g. This is called the Poisson bracket, uh, Garner's Poisson bracket. And for this Poisson bracket, this equation is Hamiltonian, and the energy of this uh, equation is the following one. So you take the average again of what? Of this quadratic quantity, which is u multiplied by mod du, and uh, the, this quantity, which is u cube, and with these coefficients, one half and one third. And, and the, the good news, which will be very important in the, the whole talk, and for some reason, and for, for, for uh, this Hamiltonian is integrable. So integrable is something very difficult to define for infinite uh, dimensional PDEs. Um, uh, I will give, a, a, of course, a, a formal uh, a definition in, in this talk, but uh, essentially, uh, if you refer, for instance, uh, of the definition by, uh, by Percy Dyfed uh, uh, about integrable uh, systems and integrable PDEs, he will tell you, well, integrable PDE is just an, a PDE where you can calculate everything. Okay, so that's Percy Dyfed's definition. In some sense, we will see that we are not far from his definition. So what I'm, am I going to do in this talk? I will overview how this property of integrability that I still have to define can help understand the dynamics of this equation BO, okay? So um, this equation, when I say dynamics, I say I can say everything you can imagine about, about uh, an evolution equations, okay? In the same way that when you have a, a, an evolution equation with constant coefficient, Fourier, the standard Fourier transform, which was introduced by Fourier for this, for, the, for solving the, the heat equation, uh, allows us to understand line, linear dynamics. So in some sense, uh, I will tell you that this equation system is integrable because it, it has a Fourier transform. But this Fourier transform is nonlinear. So I'm going, going to introduce some nonlinear Fourier transform, which will serve essentially in studying the dynamics in the same way that the usual Fourier transform helps you 
to understand linear dynamics of constant coefficients. Okay. So now let me come to the outline of this talk. So there are several, uh, there, there are several uh, chapters, but all the chapters are essentially one or two slides, nothing, nothing more. So essentially there will be two, two, two parts. The first part will be a review of results. So I will give you results about the, the results we were able to prove and compare to, to what was already known about sharp well posedness of the initial value problem, about the long time behavior of the solution, which will be in fact a, a property of almost periodicity. I will remind you what it is, about special solutions, which are called solitons and multi-solitons, about other a little less special, but very interesting solutions, which are called w, doubly periodic solutions. So we already know that we have periodic functions in X, and I will study also periodic solutions in time. And finally, I will talk about what is called the smoothing property. It's a little bit more uh, technical, so I will tell you what it is, but it is strongly connected to a gauge transform that Terry Tao introduced in 2004 in the purpose of solving the Cauchy problem for, for the X equation. And the second part of, uh, of slides will be devoted to the nonlinear Fourier transform and the lax pair identity, which allows us to, uh, to understand all these properties by finally uh, going to some uh, explicit formula, because uh, one of the uh, important uh, facts, just to, in some sense, to paraphrase uh, Percy Dyfed, uh, uh, principle that I quoted uh, uh, in the previous slide that uh, we have, in fact, an explicit formula for the, every solution of Benjamin on no equation on the torus. And I will finish by some perspectives. Okay, so let me start with the uh, sharp well posedness result. So the well posedness theory is a global well posedness theory, in fact, precisely because uh, in 1979, so something like a little more than 10 years after, after introducing, uh, after the introduction of Benjamin Ono equation, uh, Bock and Kruskal proved that there are many conservation laws, formal conservation laws, and they control all the sub-left norms, hk over 2, for k uh, positive integer. So the L2 norm, for instance, is conserved, but then you have uh, the, for, for k equals one, which corresponds to the h half norm, we have this energy that I, I gave you. And then you can control uh, subsequently all the h1 norm, h3 half norm, h2 norm, etc. Formally, at least formally. Then for global well posedness, you just need local well posedness in these norms. And, and that was done, okay, in 1979, probably the first time in h2. So H2, uh, for, for those people who know about uh, nonlinear hyperbolic systems, uh, the threshold in general is half the dimension plus one. And uh, here, since the dimension is one, so you have three half. And for every regularity more than three half, so typically the regularity two, uh, you have local well posedness, which is immediately transformed into global well posedness because of this conservation law controlling the H2 norm. And then from 1979, you had a long series of uh, results trying to lower the level of regularity of the well posedness. Uh, Gustavo Ponce, Terry Tao, uh, uh, Carlos Koenig, Alex Ionescu, but that was rather on the line. But these techniques were, uh, in fact, applied then on the torus. To finish with Molinot, Molinet, Luc Molinet in 2008, who proved that we have global well posedness in L2. All the techniques here were, in fact, based on, uh, I would say, PDE methods. Okay, uh, PDE methods in the sense that you can make some change, uh, subtle change of unknowns. That was, uh, in fact, the, the normal form of tau, the gauge transform of tau, and then apply. Uh, techniques from uh, from uh, dispersive PDEs, uh, Bourguin method, Bourguin spaces, whatever, whatever, and finally you get some well posedness in L two. And uh, Moulin et Pilot uh, wrote a very nice review paper in analysis and PDEs in two thousand twelve, uh, and uh, and uh, which 
in some sense, is still a very good reference for these PDE methods. Now, it turns out that you can go below L2. So if you have a look at this equation in red here, du dt plus ddx of u square plus something linear, well, you say, okay, below L2, for instance, if u is a distribution in Hs for S negative, how can I define u square? You cannot define u square for distribution u in Hs for S negative. It's not it's not cannot be defined in general. Nevertheless, we proved with Thomas Kepler and Peter Topalov two years ago that the flow map, the flow map, which means the mapping which sends the initial datum to the solution at time t, which will well define for smooth enough data, smooth enough functions, for instance, H2, this flow map can be continuously extended to Hs for every s strictly bigger than minus a half, but not on Hs for s equals minus a half, for instance. What does that mean? Well, let's, let's do it, uh, I mean, more concretely. I'm giving you some function u0, which is in Hs for s, say, uh, strictly bigger than minus a half, but imagine it's very negative. Let's say s equals minus one fourth. So what can I do? I can regularize, of course, I can smooth u0 out by some, my favorite regularizer. So I will find a sequence u0 epsilon, which converges to u0 in Hs, but the u0 epsilon are very smooth, say C infinity on the torus. And now for every epsilon, I can solve, thanks to so, uh, for instance, uh, Jean-Claude So uh, results, I can solve globally my initial value problem with initial data u0 epsilon. So I get a family of solution u epsilon. Now what happens as epsilon goes to zero, this theorem tells you that as epsilon goes to zero, u epsilon at every time t converge strongly in Hs to some function which is always the same. Always the same, whatever is the uh, process of regularization of u0. Okay, so in some sense, you have proved some uh, abstract continuous extension. What does that mean? If you look precisely at this equation, this means, in fact, that u square, which is here, if you think of u epsilon square, this means that ddx of u square will have a limit but a limit in the distributions in T and X, not in X, but in T and X, the U epsilon square will have a limit in the sense of distribution because the other part will, will have a limit. So this means that you can, if you renormalize, you have a DDX here. So if you renormalize U epsilon square by withdrawing its average and the average of U square, is of course the L2 norm to the square of U, which is a function which is independent of T, because I told you that the L2 norm is conserved. So if you renormalize U square by withdrawing the L2 norm square, which in general will tend to infinity, then this result tells you that in some sense, this, I mean, not in some sense, this, this quantity will have a, a limit in the sense of distribution, okay? which is absolutely non-trivial. It seems that there is a question here. Okay, what's special for S equals one half, minus one half? Yes, Slim. Uh, I will tell you because this is precisely the answer. Uh, the answer is, is in the next slide. Okay, so just be patient. <laughs> there is okay, but but I can already tell you that s equals minus one half. If you think you are on the line and on on the circle, this is a scaling regularity. You have a scaling here, and h minus one half, h dot minus one half, is precisely the regularity which is invariant by scaling. Okay, so you could say that formally this equation is h minus a half critical. Okay, so that's not so surprising, but still we have to look at what's going on. So what about this wave Posner threshold? It turns out that with Peter Topalov, we made some progress here. And uh, I'm going to introduce some, uh, I mean, slightly more uh, precise spaces, sub -f spaces. So I'm, I'm defined sub -f spaces with a second regularity, which is a logarithmic regularity, Hs log alpha. So S and alpha are real numbers. 
And I define the, the space of distribution of the circle such that the Fourier coefficients u hat of k satisfy that the sum of u hat of k square times the one plus k square to the s times the log of k to the two alpha, this series is finite. Of course, for alpha equals zero, this is just the standard HS sub F space. Now I, I, I introduce this logarithm for the reason, the following reason. In fact, what we can prove is that the flow map S of T continuously extends to H minus a half comma log to the one half. This guy is bigger than all the HS for S strictly bigger than minus a half. But it's smaller strictly than H minus a half. Okay? This is in fact the ultimate space where you can solve Benjamin Nono. And you can prove that you have this continuous extension of the flow map, but you can also prove that there exists a sequence of smooth data which converge to zero weakly in this space, such that for every positive time on any time interval, as small as, 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 as you want, the, the, the function which sends t to the solution, the, the approximate solution, s of t u0 epsilon, has no pointwise limit in the sense of distributions in x. So there is absolutely no hope to, to have a, a, a limit in the sense of distribution of these smooth solutions, while the data are weakly conversion to zero in this space. If it was strongly to zero, I would be sure that the solution will st go strongly to zero in, in the same space. So you, you see, we are really in the threshold between weak convergence and strong convergence. It seems that there is another, okay, no, that's okay. There is no other question. Yeah. There is no, no uh, other question, all right. So is it clear? I mean, uh, Slim, is that, is that clear to you? All right, I, I hope, okay, so this is a, a, a slightly, more precise information about this threshold. In fact, the bottom of regularity for Benjamin Nono is this one, h minus a half comma log to the a half. So this may seem a little mysterious to you for the moment. I'm, I totally understand that, but we will see why at the end of the talk, okay? When we will see how to prove that kind of things. For the moment, let's take this for granted, okay? Sorry, Patrick, there is another question from Julian Gutierrez. Uh, can we think of this space as a weighted version of the traditional space? Yes, it's a, it's a weighted version of H minus one half, but, but you know, it's strictly smaller than H minus one half. So, so we have a, a tor with two different regularity. You have the regularity, the S regularity with standard one, and you have the logarithmic uh, scale in some sense, which is the alpha here. And, and this logarithmic scale is uh, more precise, so which allows you to give a, a more precise statement here. And this is the sharp one. Clearly this is sharp one because you have here a weak convergence in this same space for which the approximate solution breaks down. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. Now, it's nice now to have global well posedness in, in any space, etc., and to know what kind of regularity is important. But what is even nicer in this theory of, of, uh, of uh, evolution PDEs is to know what's going on for a long time. What is the long time behavior of solutions? And for this, we have a very general statement which is the following. For every S strictly bigger than minus a half, trajectories in HS are almost periodic in the sense of Harald Bohr. So the sense of Harald Bohr is the following. For every epsilon positive, there is a length positive such that every interval of length L contains a number tau, which is a epsilon period, epsilon pseudo period. So, so that for every T, the translation of u by tau differs from u at time t in HS from less than epsilon. Okay, so this is the definition of Aralbo of an almost periodic 
function. Now, there is another definition, and it also holds this almost periodicity. It also holds in our space uh, with, with two indices, my h minus a half log at one half. But uh, I prefer this criterion, which was due to Solomon Bartner, which tells you that a, a function u from the line to some Hilbert space, or any Banach space, in fact, is almost periodic if and only if the set of translations, translations of u by some real number two, this set is relatively compact in the, the set of bounded continuous function on the line valued in H. It's a nice compactness criterion. And this is in fact, the one we used to prove that. But you see, what does that mean? What does mean this almost periodicity? Imagine that you take epsilon equal one over N, okay? And now I take, I, I take a length L, and I, I, I take an interval, which is very, very large, very, very large. So I take the interval n, n plus l, ln. Then I will take, I will find an, a number two, which goes to infinity, such that the translation of u by, by this tau, tau n, will converge uniformly to u as n goes to infinity. This means that you have some kind of Poincaré recurrence property. The trajectory of an almost periodic function can be approximated by translations going by, by a, a vector of translation going to infinity, uh, translation of the same trajectories. So that's very, very surprising. It means that you have, in fact, a uniform recurrence property. Okay. So this says something about the long time behavior of all these trajectories. And the nice thing is that this is true for all the solutions we have constructed. Okay. All right, so let me continue. Uh, now I'm going to talk about special solutions because uh, in fact, the, the whole theory of integrable PDE is started probably with the Cordeveil equation. And the Cordeveil degrees equation was certainly <laughs> famous because there are special solutions which are called solitons, okay? And solitons for me will be solutions of the form u of x minus ct, okay? For some constant c, which is called the velocity. So you just think of a solution which moves with velocity c. Uh, if you look at, at the, uh, at the um, graph of this solution, it will just be a translation uh, with finite velocity, constant velocity in time. Okay, so it turns out that uh, uh, when when Benjamin introduced his paper, he found an example of of such soliton, and the example is the Poisson kernel that I wrote here, p r of x for every r between zero and one. It turns out that this is a soliton for Benjamin alone, and that's a result by Benjamin, okay, himself. And uh, the nice result by Amik and Tolan, something like uh, almost 30 years after this, is that you can characterize, classify all solitons for Benjamin Ono. And they are not very far from this, up to a constant. There are these functions. You can, of course, translate them by some, some, uh, some angle alpha. And you can uh, multiply uh, x by, by some integer n. Okay. And these are all the soliton solutions of that. What I claim is that, uh, of course, for, for Amic and Tolon in 1995, you had to, to assume that your solution was at least already in L2 or in H1 or whatever. What we proved, and in fact, this is also true in HS for every S strictly bigger than minus a half. And this is also true even in this H minus a half log to the one half, okay? And moreover, these solitons are orbitally stable in every HS. What does that mean? It means that if you are, I, I, make, I take such a soliton and I make a small error on the initial data in HS for S bigger than minus or half, then I claim that the solution will stay not close to the function itself, but close to the orbit of the function by translations. So the PR of X plus alpha. Okay, that's the orbital stability, and we can prove that. Sorry, to, in yes. sorry to interrupt, Patrick. There is a question from George Kiao. This soliton decays at both infinities. This soliton is periodic. 
Do you do you remember we are in the solution the situation of periodic boundary conditions? So there is no infinities on the circle. Okay. So uh okay, I would like yes. Now I'm, I, I would like to talk about a little more general uh, solutions, which are called multisolitons. So what happens if I take a sum of such solitons here? I made them uh, with average zero. It's not really, as I told you, a, a, a serious uh, a, a serious reduction. So I, I, I take n Poisson kernels with mean zero here, with different parameters r and different number, uh, number alphas, it turns out that this is a nice manifold of dimension 2n, which turns out to be symplectic with respect to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Poisson bracket I, I defined. And on this manifold, the benjamin -Ono flow is acting. What does that mean? It means that there is a system of ODEs on the RJ of t and alpha j of t. So, 2n, 2n by 2n system of ODEs, such that the solution here, U, is, is a solution of BO if and only if these parameters satisfy a system. And moreover, it turns out that you can solve explicitly this system. This is integrability. And here, this is integrable in the sense of Liouville and Kovalevskaya. Okay? So that's what we proved. And in fact, that was already proved by different methods uh, by Dobrochotov and Krishev and the, the Russian school in 1991. And there are also other, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't quote all the, the, the results about that. There are many also from the Japanese school, people like uh, uh, Matsuno worked a lot on that. I'm sorry, I, I cannot quote everyone, but okay. This was uh, something uh, known. And all, that's also known on the line, by the way. And in fact, in that case, you have Poisson kernels on the line, which are decaying like one over x squared. Okay. So these are multisolitons. This is a slightly more general uh, family of solutions. And now I would like to come to an even more general family of solutions, which are what I call doubly periodic solutions. And here we will see very interesting phenomenon. So I'm looking at functions which are periodic, 2 pi periodic in X, and which are periodic of period T in the time variable. And I'm asking, are there doubly, such doubly periodic solutions of Benjamin Ono? This is usually not a, a, an easy problem. Of course, there are examples. These examples I gave you, for instance, of solitons, they are definitely uh, 2 pi periodic. There are two pi periodic solutions, u of x minus ct. And they are periodic in time uh, with period t equals two pi over c, sure. But in general, well, you, you can certainly find by, by, by fixing some special values of these parameters for finding multisolitons, which are also two pi periodic. But now, are there others? And the theorem is as follows. This will depend on two objects. The first one is a the period in time, which I call denote by capital T. And the other term will be the average, the mean value of my solution. Okay, so I'm looking for solutions which are doubly periodic of period T in time and of mean value A. First result, if the ratio of the two periods, namely the period in time and the period in X is rational, and if, the mean value is rational, for instance, mean value zero. Then every L2 periodic solution, doubly periodic solution with mean value A is a multisoliton. So it's a very strong result of regularity. In particular, if it's L2, it's real analytic because it's a sum, a finite sum of Poisson kernels. Okay. So it's real analytic, but it's even more than real analytic. It's really algebraic like, like a Poisson kernel it is, okay? Now, what is really surprising, what struck me very much, and in fact, it's a result I had only a couple of weeks ago. Now, I claim that there exist periodic, doubly periodic solutions with t equal two pi. So periodic two pi in X and in time with mean value zero, 
which belong to every HS for S negative, but which do not belong to L2. Otherwise, there would be a, a multisoliton. So in some sense, there is a, a new threshold about Benjamin Nono and periodic solution of Benjamin Nono. This threshold is a regularity L2. If you are looking at two, again, doubly periodic two pi, two pi solutions with mean value zero, just to, to, to simplify, if they are L2, they are multisolitons, they are real analytic, but below L2, there are many others. And this is quite striking because it means that if you don't know about solutions in HS for S negative, which was in fact one of, of the uh, specificity of our result, you would not be able to find such solutions. Okay. Now, in the case of irrational mean value of, of irrational ratio of, of periods, you can find in fact many more, many more periodic solutions. And, and, and this is the, the statements three and four that I gave here. There exist L2 two pi periodic solutions with mean value A, which are not H1, for instance. There are many. Okay, so in that case, you have some kind of irrationality which helps you find such even more, more solutions. But probably the most striking part I would like to, uh, to emphasize here is probably the first two results. Again, again, just think of periodic solutions, two pi, two pi with mean value zero, I claim. If they are L2, they are multisolitons. If they are below L2, then you can find many others. That's very strange. Okay, so uh, finally, I would like to talk about Terry Tao's gauge transform. Uh, so this is a, a nice transformation for, for those who know about Berger's equation. And when I say Berger's equation, I will say the viscous Berger's equation with some, some viscosity term minus epsilon dx square. Uh, you, you know that there is a very magic form, uh, transformation, which is sometimes called the Kohl-Hopf transformation which transforms the, uh, the Burgers, viscous Burgers equation into the heat equation. And uh, when, uh, when you, you, try, you are faced with, with the benjamin -Ono sort of equation, you can see that benjamin -Ono in some sense is a complex, a complex part, a complex version in some sense of the, the, the viscous Burgers equation, okay? So I claim that there is some kind of complex Kohl-Hopf transformation, and this is what Terry Tau introduced. So you take a real valued solution or a real valued function with mean value zero, and you take dx minus one u, which is a primitive of u, which is still periodic with mean value zero, okay? which means that you just divide by the wave number i, k, if each, its Fourier coefficient of u hat of k. And then you take the exponential, so it's a very nonlinear transformation, exponential minus i, this guy. There is no problem, it's, it's still bounded because u is real, dx minus one is real. So you take the exponential of i, something real, it's of modulus one. Then you project pi, Project on what? Pi is what? Is a so-called Zegger projector. You project on non-negative frequencies, this function. And then you take again the derivative in X, which means that in some sense, the regularity of this G of U will be the same as the regularity of U. If U is in HS, this guy will be in HS for S bigger than minus a half, say. Well, I will assume that S is non-negative here for simplicity. And you can prove that G is a one-to-one -one map from the functions of HS with mean value zero onto a proper open subset of HS intersected by L2 plus. L2 plus is what, what is L2 with only non-zero uh, 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 Fourier modes, which are non-zero only for, for, for K non-negative. So if you prefer L2 plus is those function in L2 such that the, the Fourier coefficient F hat of K is zero if K is strictly negative. Okay, so uh, the nice thing is that this gauge transform will help uh, understand the, 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 the dynamics of Benjamin Ono. And this is in fact uh, an observation which was also done 
by Isom, Monsavinos, O, and Stefanov last year with different techniques and uh, slightly uh, less optimal results. Uh, so you, I give you a, a number S, regularity S, and I look at a function U0 in HS with mean value zero. And I look at the following equation, which is a linear equation. So the initial value of this linear equation will be tau's gauge transform applied to u0, OK? And now I look at the linear Schrodinger equation, just the linear Schrodinger equation with some term here, which is a constant term. It does not change, for instance, the fact that the L2 norm is constructed, et cetera. Then I claim that this solution, w, is a well approximate, it's a good approximation of the tau gauge transform of the solution of Benjamin Ono at time t. What does that mean? Good approximation in the sense that the difference between these two guys is more regular. It's h s plus sigma of s. For instance, if s is bigger than a half, you have gained one derivative. So from the viewpoint of high frequencies, it will tell you that the, all the high frequencies, the main high frequencies, will be in, here in w for, for u of t. Not for u of t, but for g of u of t. So this tells you that if you make this strange change of unknown, then the benjamin Ono equation becomes something which has some smoothing property in the sense that you can describe the main high frequency effect just by looking at linear Schrodinger equation. This is very strange. And you also have some, some gain, which is a little less good for S between zero and half. All these estimates, all these things are optimal. We know that they are optimal. Okay, so now I, I uh, okay, I, I hope I have uh, a couple of minutes <laughs> to tell you how to, to prove all these results. So to prove all these results, I will use the nonlinear Fourier transform, which is inherited of the lax pair structure of this equation. So what is a nonlinear Fourier transform? So just let me remind you what is the linear Fourier transform. <laughs> so let's assume that I'm looking at the Benjamin Ono, the linear Benjamin Ono. So the linearized at zero Benjamin Ono. This is this equation, ddtu minus ddx of mod du equals zero. And u zero is, is real valued with mean zero. Again, on the circle. Now I claim that the Fourier transformation, the one what, which was introduced by Joseph Fourier in the beginning of the 19th century for studying the heat equation, allows us to solve the problem because the Fourier coefficient of u at time t is just given by the Fourier coefficient of u at time zero times what? If k is non is non-negative, times e to the i t k square. Is that correct? Because when you change pass in Fourier here, you will have i k mod k, but since k is positive, it's just i k square. So you have e to the i t k square. So my purpose is to generalize this formula to Benjamin Ono with some different Fourier transformation. So what is it? Benjamin Ono is this guy, so I just added this nonlinear term. I still concentrate on real valued solution with mean zero and claim there exists a transformation which sends every function u to a sequence of coefficients that we will call nonlinear Fourier coefficients of u, which allows us to solve the problem in the sense that u at time t solution of this Benjamin Ono equation is given by zeta n of u of t equals e to the i t omega n of u zero, zeta n of u zero. So that's my my generalization, where omega n, as n goes to infinity, is essentially n square again. But this omega n, and this is a very important difference with the linear case, this omega n will depend on u0, non-linearly, in a mysterious way that I will tell you. OK? So this is what I call the non-linear Fourier transform. Some process, magical process, which is a transformation from functions uh, on, the, on the torus to uh, coefficients, sequences of coefficients, nonlinear Fourier coefficients, such that the evolution of this equation will be given by that. Okay. Now I claim that such 
a transformation does exist. And for this, I'm going also to define a sequence, a space of sequences of complex numbers labeled by uh, positive integers, such that, uh, which corresponds to, in some sense, uh, Fourier coefficients of HS log alpha. So this is a sum of n to the 2s, so log 1 plus n to the 2 alpha zeta n square converge. So you can think of alpha equals zero first. This is really the, the Fourier coefficients of HS. Okay, and, and then you add this new weight log, log to the alpha. And I claim that there exists a diffeomorphism from the set of functions in H minus a half log one half of, valued, of, of mean value zero and real value to the space zeta n in, uh, in H zero log one alpha. And this also uh, a diffeomorphism from the functions hs for s bigger than minus a half to h s plus a half. You may re wonder where why there is a shift of one half derivative between uh, the functions and the sequences. Well, just because I want this object to be symplectic. Symplectic in the following sense that if you compute the Poisson brackets of the zeta n's and the zeta p, or of the zeta n and zeta b p bar, you get either zero or minus the Kronecker symbol delta n p, which would exactly what would you get for the standard Fourier coefficients. Okay, so these are the same uh, Poisson commutations for Fourier coefficients. This is for for symplectic theory, and for even more important uh, for my PDE, I get that I have. This identity, zeta n of u of t equals e to the i t omega n of u zero, zeta n of u zero, where omega n of u zero is very explicit. This is what, what people in Hamiltonian dynamics, uh, integrable Hamiltonian dynamics call frequencies. And these frequencies are n square minus this series. So you see it depends on u zero, but this term is in fact of lower order, uh, as you can see, if, uh, if you remember where you are, okay? So this is the theorem. There is this diffeomorphism such as that. In fact, there are many other properties of this diffeomorphism, and I would like to review them uh, briefly, and because these properties will give you all the proofs to the previous result that I stated. First of all, phi exchanges bounded subset of HS and H plus a, HS plus a half. What does that mean? It means that if I have a bounded subset in HS, phi send it on a bounded subset of HS plus a half. And conversely, the inverse image of a set in HS plus a half is a bounded subset in HS. Second, if you translate your function by some, some parameter two of translation, you get exactly the formula you would get for Fourier coefficient. The Fourier coefficient of U of dot plus two is the Fourier coefficient of U multiplied by E to the I and two. Then, Third, characterization of traveling waves. Traveling waves are in fact characterized by the fact that the set of n such that zeta n is different from zero, this set is just a single term, just one set. So this means that you have unimodal, unimodal uh, functions in the sense, and then you can characterize them. So that's rather easy. And then you characterize them to be the Poisson kernels. And this is a, an inverse formula that we can, we can prove. The same for characterization of n solitons. n solitons, are, which are sums of n Poisson kernels. So these are uh, functions such that the zeta n are zero for n strictly bigger than big n, and zeta big n is different from zero. There are also Parseval formula, like for Fourier analysis, sum of n zeta n square is a half of u in L2 square nonlinear Parseval, you have an expansion of the frequencies in L2, or, uh, which is n square minus the L2 norm of u square plus some, some remainder term. And finally, you have a high frequency limit, which tells you that uh, when you look at zeta n multiplied by i square root of n, you get the Fourier transform of tau's gauge transform. So tau's gauge transform is in some sense a high frequency limit of our Nonlinear Fourier transform, nonlinear Fourier coefficients. So that's why it's so important here. And you can get all the results by all this list of properties. So, how to 
construct them, and uh, that will be uh, almost my lifestyle. How to construct them? You construct them by using a lax pair, which means that you are working on the RD space that I already defined. So these functions, which are only non-negative free modes, the projector uh, corresponding uh, to the Sega projector on this RD space. And given a function in this space, I can define a self-adjoint operator by this formula. My God, how can you define this self-adjoint operator if you is so, so nasty? And the answer is very simple. If you know a little bit of spectral theory, to define a self-adjoint operator, there is a wonderful recipe, which is rather than looking at the operator, you should look at the form, the quadratic form or emission form associated, which is f given by lu of f dot f. If you look at the quadratic form associated here, you will have one over i df dx f, comma f. But since we are on L2 plus, this is essentially the higher part of the h of half norm square. So this will be the main part. And then you have some remember, the remainder term that you would like to prove is compact with respect to this form. Well, what does that mean? It means that you take the inner product of uf with f if f is in h a half. In other words, you take the inner product of u with f square. I take an f in h a half, remember your course of functional analysis. I take an f in h a half in one space dimension. Where is h f square? F square is not in h a half, where we are just on the on the on the threshold. Okay. If you were in h s for s bigger than a half, that would be an algebra. But h a half is not an algebra. Still, you can prove that f square is not in h a half, but it's in h a half comma log to the minus a half. That's easy using dyadic decompositions, for instance. But this h of half log to the minus a half, what is is dual space? Is dual space is here. H minus a half, comma, log to the half. And that's why I'm dealing with this space, because this is the one which makes this operator self-adjoint and semi-bounded. Now, if you is much more smooth, you can prove, and this is was proved by, by Fokas and Ablovitz and also by Nakamura in a different way, uh, that uh, DDT of LU is a bracket BU LU, where BU is some nice, uh, nice anti self adjoint operator here. Uh, don't, don't pay attention too much on, on this expression. What is important here is that the spectrum of LU will be conserved by the Benjamin Ono evolution, and all these quantities LUK11 are also conserved. You can prove it. And these are, in fact, the quantities that were found by Kaup, uh, by Buck and, and Kruskal in 1979, even with a slightly different way, but, but that's what happened. So now, when you have that, you can construct your nonlinear Fourier transform. And here's the formula. The formula is that if you look at the spectrum of value, it's made of an increasing sequence of eigenvalues going to plus infinity. That's just because I have a semi-bounded operator self-adjoint with, with uh, compact resolvent. And then I look at the difference between two consecutive eigenvalues. And the nice lemma is that the difference between two consecutive eigenvalues is at least one. So they are simple. And moreover, they are simple, but their, their difference is all, at least one. So if I look at the difference minus one, it's a quantity that I call gamma n, which I call the nth gap. And then if I normalized in the right way, uh, the orthonormal basis, the corresponding orthonormal basis of eigenvectors of LU, then I define my zeta n, my nonlinear Fourier coefficient, by the square root of this gap gamma n times the exponential of minus i, the argument of the average of my eigenfunction fn. So I have this eigenfunction fn, and I look at its, its average on the circle. So I claim that if this average is not zero, it has an argument, and so I can define zeta n. If the average is zero, well, I cannot define the argument, but you can prove in that case that the gamma n is zero as well, so you can define zeta n. 
And it turns out that with this definition, you can prove all the properties and you have the, your constructing, uh, you have constructed your nonlinear Fourier transform. Of course, it's very, very fast. I, I, um, I agree with you, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of this construction. Finally, uh, I, I finished by the explicit formula. This is very recent. It's less than one month. And uh, uh, it tells you that in fact, if you look at a solution of Benjamin Ono, in this equation, you have an explicit formula. What it is, you can compute the real Fourier coefficient, the standard Fourier coefficient you had of TK for K non-negative by taking the average of some function on the circle, which is obtained by what? You take the projection of U0 on the RD space. So you forget about the negative frequencies. And then you make some operator acting on that, the power of K, the Kth power of some operator, which is the composition of S star. S star is the left shift on the RD space. It's something very simple to understand, to figure out. If you think of Fourier coefficient, you just look at the the list of Fourier coefficient, f hat of zero, f hat of one, et cetera, and you shift it on the left, which you get, you replace it by f hat of one, f hat of two. So you look at that, and then you multiply by the exponential of it, exponential of two it lu zero, where lu zero is this lu, this operator, self-adjoint operator. But this is the self-adjoint operator for u zero. And I claim that this very simple formula for every U0, every U0 in this very, very general uh, subtle space gives you an explicit formula for your solution. This is somewhat striking, but on the other hand, you may, you should keep in mind that even with a, such a simple and compact formula, you need, I mean, you need other tools for proving that, you, for instance, your function u of t will be almost periodic. And it's not so clear that it's almost periodic valued in this space from that very compact formula. So for the moment, uh, I, I need the previous works to, to get all the properties, but it's, I think it was important to give you uh, 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 this formula, the, which is very recent. For the moment, for instance, for KDV, no such formula is known. Okay. So finally, here are perspectives. Uh, of course, the, the, the most uh, natural question you, you could ask is what, what's going on on the line? Okay. Well, on the line, the nonlinear Fourier transform is still to be defined. There are some partial results, uh, which are already rather old by Koifman and Wickerhauser uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, uh, for small, smooth, decaying data. But, uh, and you, there are much more recent results by, by uh, Blaine Talbot, who is a, a student, who, former student of, of uh, Monica Vision and Rowan Killip for H estimate of the HS norm of smooth solutions. And I know, I know that there is some work in progress by Rowan Killip, Monica Vision, and their uh, PhD student Thierry Laurence for proving the same kind of sharp well posedness that we prove on the line. But the, the the problem is to, to also to understand the long time phenomena. So there is a description of multi soliton manifold, which was done by my, my student who will see soon. And now there is also an explicit formula on the line in the same flavor as what I, I gave you in the previous slide. So the main issue now is to understand the long time behavior and the long time soliton resolutions for, for these arbitrary solutions, which means that a solution, an arbitrary solution, as t goes to infinity, would be a superposition of solitons plus some remainder term, which is dispersive, okay? There are other questions, the zero dispersion limit of uh, Benjamin Ono equation, which was investigated already by Peter Miller and his collaborator, Xu, and also by my former student, uh, Luis Gasso, uh, using, using uh, these integrable techniques. And, I think there is still work to be in progress with, with this new idea of, of, uh, of uh, uh, explicit formula. And finally, there is, of course, the question of long time perturbations of BO. So if you perturbate a little bit BO so that it's no more integrable, is it possible to make some KEM theory and uh, Nekoroshev type results, which tells you that you have at least estimates on your solution for very, very long time 
with respect to the smallness of the perturbation. And this is some work in progress with Dario Bambuzi. Okay, I think I'm done. These are uh, some references. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Patrick. I think I'm going to thank on behalf of everybody for this beautiful talk. VN analysis rarely have a, a, a ability to work with explicit formulas. So this seems like magic to me. <laughs> Still to me too, in fact. <laughs> let's open the Zoom for questions. Yes. Okay, so people can, um, you can unmute yourself and ask a question or alternatively you can put it in Q&A. And if you unmute yourself, please uh, remind us of your name. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Peter, go yeah, ahead. My, uh, so I, this is Peter Miller. Um, very nice talk, Patrick. I, I liked oh, it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious if you had any thoughts about uh, um, the periodic version of the intermediate long wave equation. <laughs> no, for the moment, no, unfortunately, uh, because uh, what I can do here is strongly related to the structure of hardy space I have. And, and the fact that the, the lax pair these operators LU and BU that I defined here are acting on the Hardy space and have nice commuting properties with this operator, which is the left shift, which is really uh, the skeleton of the Hardy space. You know, you have on this one side the Hardy space, which have a very important property, very important structure connected to this shift operator that was. I mean, uh, uh, since Arne Berling and Lax, in fact, in the 50s, uh, uh, there was this, this extraordinary uh, papers about the characterization of translation invariant subspaces uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have some Lax pair, LUBU. And it turns out, I, as I wrote here, that there are very explicit commutation identities between all these guys. And unfortunately, I cannot find them for ILW so far. I, I, I guess don't it makes sense. It's connected with, with yes. Yeah, so if we don't, if we can't do it for KDV, right? It should yes, be that's the know, same reason. Interpolating between, reason. right? Yes, that's the same reason. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, for the moment, this works only for Benjamin Nono and other kind of equations. For instance, uh, it does exist for for some equation. I'm still I'm, I'm currently working. Uh, on with with my collaborator Enno Lenzmann, uh, which is a, a Calogero Moser derivative nonlinear Schrodinger equation. There is mm. also this half wave map uh, equation that we worked. We we introduced some lax pair on this equation some some years ago with Enno, and all these equations have the same kind of, uh, I mean, uh, flavor uh, with respect to the Hardy space, and so we can expect, and I, I, I'm pretty sure they they exist now. Uh, similar uh, identities and similar explicit formula for them, but not for KDV, not for cubic NLS, not for DNLS, not for the AKNS system. That's, you know, in some sense, it seems like there are two kinds of families of integrable systems. One family where Riemann Hilbert approaches are very good and strong, and one other family where the RD space. And the shift operators may, may some, be some, some kind of uh, ansatz, ersatz maybe of, of Riemann Hilbert, because you know, mm. you know more than I know that uh, the Riemann Hilbert uh, method for these non local things is really a pain. Okay. Yes, right. <laughs> it doesn't really work. <laughs> it doesn't really work. And yeah. that's the same for. So ILW is in between in some sense, mm. because it's in between KDV. And, and, and Benjamin Nono. So mm -hmm. are we, for this, this is really the mystery. And uh, I was discussing this with Peter Perry uh, a couple of weeks ago in Vienna. And he was, uh, of course, very excited about this new formula, which exists also on the line, by the way. Mm -hmm. okay? There is a formula of that kind on the line, as I mentioned. But for the moment, we can't uh, extend it to ILW. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
Peter and Patrick. Any other question or comment for Patrick? Again, you can unmute yourself and say your name. Okay, there is a question in Q&A. Um, okay, Aslimi uh, uh, Bracken is saying Slimi. beautiful Slimi. talk <laughs> and thanking you. Okay. So maybe while people are thinking of question, if I can ask one, um, I was wondering, so since it's an integrable system, Benjamin on is integrable equation, and you said it's Hamiltonian, so there's this Poisson bracket. So presumably there is this infinite hierarchy of, uh, so maybe I would, uh, I should ask you that I presume that there is infinite hierarchy of equations yes. such that when you look at higher conserved quantity, each of these higher conserved quantities Hamiltonian corresponding to that equation in the hierarchy. So here's a crazy question. So this algebra, I understand that as you told us, even online, it's not clear that this can be transferred, but there is this hierarchy which is associated with Benjaminano. Are any of these, can somehow one think or hope that some of these methods can be transferred to that, to some other equation in the hierarchy? Yes, all the equations are, are, are of the hierarchy. You you can you have the same lax pair, the same first lax operator, but the second lax operator is is different, of course. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was in fact done in in uh, the thesis of Louise Gasso. Uh, she she studied she studied the the other. Uh, it's it's a paper in Annal de l'Institut Henri Poincaré, Analyse non linéaire. She studied uh, the second equation of the hierarchy, which mm -hmm. looks like. A mixture of KDV and Benjamin Ono. A mixture because the, the highest derivative is, is a third derivative, but you also have nonlinear terms which look like which are non-local and look, look like Benjamin Ono. For this equation, she proved essentially that the you can use the same nonlinear Fourier transform for, so, for, for solving it. You can use mm -hmm. the same nonlinear Fourier transform. And what is really nice is that uh, then the, the, the global well posner theory is shifted on one half regularity. Mm -hmm. So you have L2, which is the bottom. And uh, I, I strongly conjecture that uh, for the next uh, equation of the hierarchy, it will be H half, half. Mm -hmm. and, and then H, H1, et cetera. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was also able to characterize the solitons. And what is really nice is that if you go up in the hierarchy, you have more solitons. Mm -hmm. There are more solitons, and some of them are unstable, unstable. And she was already able to see that just yes. one step up. Uh -huh. Yes. And so you, so I refer. It's a very nice paper in Annal de l'Institut Henri Poincaré. I think it appeared last year. Louise Thank Gassou. you, Louise Gassou. You, you might have uh, met her in uh, in Brown. Uh, in in the last four, I don't know. I mean, some. some I think people, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she was. She was. She was postdoc in Brown uh, in ICERM uh, last year. She's now in Cineres in Paris. Thank you, Patrick.